It's my great honor to introduce our next speaker, Zainab Malik. Zainab is a lawyer who heads the advocacy at the Justice Project Pakistan, which is headquartered in Lahore. She holds law degrees from Lahore University of Management Science and from Harvard Law, which is a small uh, liberal arts college on the East Coast, um, with concentrations in international human rights and criminal justice and feminist jurisprudence. Justice Project Pakistan is a nonprofit human rights law firm based in Lahore, as I said, that provides pro bono legal advice, representation, and investigative services for the most vulnerable prisoners in the Pakistan um, uh, prison system. Justice Project Pakistan, for example, played a key role in the release of a number of um, uncharged Pakistani nationals who were held in detention at Bagram in Afghanistan as one of the effects of the so-called war on terror. Zainab has undertaken lobbying and advocacy on behalf of uh, the death penalty, police torture, um, custodial rape, juvenile justice, and the rights of imprisoned migrant workers, Pakistani migrant workers in Gulf states as well. Prior to joining the Justice Project, Zainab worked on legal education reform as a consultant to Pakistan's National Center for States Courts. She's also served in various capacities as an advocate, researcher, and litigator um, for organizations in Pakistan working on a range of issues, including reproductive rights, um, HIV AIDS prevention, early and child marriage, and the rights of religious minorities. She's a very busy professional. Um, and nevertheless, she has time to also write a very interesting human rights column fortnightly in The Nation, which is uh, Pakistan's leading uh, English language daily. She's been speaking to us today on Pakistan's legal margins, representing the most vulnerable, facing the harshest punishments. Thank you very much for that time, Hibash. Um, I'm really honored to be here today, especially to have this opportunity to present some of, some of the great work that my team has done over the past few years, which, as I will discuss during this presentation, have become increasingly more challenging for people in Pakistan working on the criminal justice system. And these are some of the things that I want to highlight for the first just to highlight some of the work that my organization does, we're the Justice Project Pakistan. Um, as has already been explained, we're a legal action NGO, and we represent who we call the most vulnerable of Pakistan's prison population, and who are facing the harshest punishment. And our clients are narrowly include Pakistanis facing the death penalty at home and those facing the death penalty abroad. We also represent victims of police torture and victims of the war on terror at the which resulted in the release of a ground passing ground and repatriation back into Um I want to talk a little bit about our methodology. Um, unfortunately, Justice Project Pakistan is the currently the only organization that works on issues such as the death penalty and victims of war, which makes us very unpopular during various times of Pakistan's political climate. I mean, at some times they like us better than more the other times, but generally the trend is quite hot. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, we have to, we cannot uh, focus entirely on strategic litigation. We follow a three pronged strategy. So, accompanying our strategic litigation, we're not traditionally a legal aid organization. We do not take on every case that comes to us. Our cases are selected through a process in which we determine the value of each and every case to act as a precedent in order to bring about long-term um, change within Pakistan's criminal justice system. So each and every case that we take on has to be one who subsequent cases can rely on as precedent to bring about a long-term change in Pakistan. Alongside our litigation, and as has been uh, highlighted by the previous presentation that took place today, Litigation cannot be an effective tool to affect social, economic, and long-term change. Obviously, working on issues such as death penalty, we come to realize that over the years. So, what we do is we represent prisoners in the course of law and in the course of public opinion. So, for issues like the death penalty, in order to bring about long-term social change, we need to firstly change the mindsets of people towards this punishment. 
And this is why our advocacy focuses a lot on creating empathy for people who are facing the death penalty in Pakistan. And that's something that I'll be highlighting throughout our presentation and how we've done that and what, what has been effective and what has not done so far. Another prong is our advocacy, which is the unit that I had. And strategically, this comes after Alan's presentation. And um, what happens is that we, I'm going to detract a bit from the point that Alan's made because we've had some successes with using international advocacy, particularly using the United Nations Human Rights Framework to secure the releases of some of our prisoners and to bring about the long term change that we've been hoping in Pakistan's criminal justice system, which we weren't able to do through strategic litigation and through our public advocacy. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, we also work quite closely with Pakistani legislators because. There are limits to what the courts can do, and sometimes you need to bring about legislative change, and that's something that we work quite uh, closely with. And it's actually through the UN work that legislative reform has also been pushed through Pakistan. So I'm going to highlight a bit of that. Um, so my presentation starts from a very difficult time in JPP's history, which took place on 17 December 2014. So on 17 December 2014, Pakistan brought back the moratorium. Pakistan lifted the moratorium on the death penalty. So before that, Pakistan had a six-year moratorium on the death penalty, which meant that the government of Pakistan was sentencing people to death, but no execution was given. Now, why that happened was that in December 2014, there was a very tragic terrorist attack on the army public school in Peshawar, which resulted in the death of 134 children. Basically, the terrorists broke into the school and they shot children. And it resulted in 134 deaths on the spot and many more subsequently. So obviously, the nation was in a state of shock. And there was a lot of anger coming from the people because at the time, Pakistan was involved in a war, what the government was uh, hoping to be a war against terrorism called Zarbe Az, which was a huge operation that was taking place in northern areas of terrorism. And to that point, the people had been reassured that terrorism in Pakistan was going to come to an end. And here we have this massive terrorist attack that just happened in 135 years. So this will give you an insight into kind of the public reaction against that attack, where you see people crying out for blood. And generally, the, since the government itself was so shell shocked by what had happened, the easiest thing that it could think of was to lift the moratorium on the death penalty. And at the time, there were over 8,500 people on Pakistan's death row, because with making it the largest death row in the world. And obviously, this was a huge challenge for us because a lot of these people happened to be our clients. So, this presentation is basically going to focus on our response to what had happened given all of this public opinion in favor of the death penalty and how we're working to kind of bring that around. So Pakistan resumed executions. Pakistan went at the rate of an average of 3.5 executions per week. Pakistan went from a non-executing state to the world's first, third highest execution. So starting from December 2014 to today, Pakistan has executed a total of 467 prisoners. And as you can see, the statistics in 2015, Pakistan executed 332 prisoners. In 2016, the number was 88, and in 2017, the number was 56. And I'm going to talk a little bit later in the presentation on, on why the number is actually going down. So, one of the biggest challenges that we had working in this environment and defending our clients was that there was a very strong government narrative coming saying that everybody on death row is a terrorist and we will execute on all the terrorists. And as has been highlighted by previous presentations today, the judiciary very much responds to public sentiments and the political context at the time. So whenever we would file appeals on behalf of our prisoners to stay various executions for various reasons, we were not getting any success in the work because what was happening was the government's narrative seemed to lay the blame on the judiciary as well, where we had the government coming out and saying, well, we've been arresting all the terrorists. It's the judiciary that's been letting them go, citing human rights and giving them so many rights. Whereas 
all of the grounds that she was releasing people on death row were valid and constitutional fundamental rights. But you had this mainstream um, narrative that was so strong coming from the government that she felt helpless and they were reacting all of the time, which resulted in a lot of executions, which is at the rate of 3.5 million. And back in 2015, actually, the rate was six executions. So, what we so our task was to kind of try to dismantle that government narrative and kind of make a voice for our clients, and essentially to highlight like who exactly is being executed. What we did was, based on analysis of all the figures of executions, what we discovered was that only less than 16% of all of the executions that were taking place were actually for terrorism related events. Everybody else who had been executed was for ordinary criminal events. So the government was relying on these 400 plus executions by showing them as an evidence of the great work that it was doing, arresting and controlling terrorism, when in fact only 16% were actually terrorists and everybody else was convicted for ordinary crimes. And as you can see in this graph, um, more than 89% of all executions were taking place in the world. And the province of Punjab does not count for only less than 50% of our population. And you had, and it was actually the province of Punjab where less than 6% of all executions that had taken place were for terror. Whereas the province of Punjab was the one that was actually executing the most people and it turned out not even for terrorism. And why that was happening is because the Government in the province of Pakistan was the Pakistan Muslim League, which is also the government that's in the center. And the Pakistan Muslim League essentially is in favor of the death penalty, and it's always considered it to be a good strategy for criminal justice reform. Why the moratorium was in place previously is because there was a previous government in power called the Pakistan People's Party, and they were actually against the moral against the death penalty because their founding member who is um, was executed. So every time the PPP has come into power, they brought back the moratorium, which was the case when before the terrorist attack happened. But it just so happened that during the time of the terrorist attack, the Pakistan Muslim League had come back into power and they used the terrorist attack as an excuse to bring back the death penalty. And as you can see, more than most of the 87% of the executions were taking place within their policy. So you could really see that that the death penalty, the excise of death penalty, was a political tool by the government and not so much, not as logical as rational as they were making out to be as a counter terrorist strategy. And basically, if you look at this graph, um, moving on from the point that most of the executions were taking place in the province of Bajaj, what this graph is essentially showing is that every time there was a spike in executions, there was a corresponding relationship to a terrorist attack in the province of Punjab, which was not the case for terrorism attacks that were taking place in other provinces. So essentially, the death penalty was being used by the government of Punjab to respond to terrorism attacks that were taking place in their province. So essentially, but they, they were not doing the same for other provinces. So not only are they having the highest numbers of executions, they're increasingly using them, that as a strategy to show people how they're tough on terrorists compared to the other provincial governments. So, if only 16% were terrorism, terrorists who were being executed, so who were the rest of on Pakistan's large death row population? So, based on our on the work that we were doing representing all of these kinds of cases in the death penalty, we discovered that over 27 crimes in Pakistan carry the death penalty. And these are not terrorism crimes. They include crimes such as kidnapping, rape, drug offenses, blasphemy, which most of you must be familiar with, and other crimes that we will discuss. As a result of the fact that there are 27 crimes in Pakistan that carry the death penalty, the death penalty population had grown to 8,500. And what we discovered subsequently, based on our analysis of these figures, was that because the prisons were so overcrowded, that prisons were actually using the death penalty to clear out the prison population. So we actually did a statistical study where we found out that for every 70 prisons added to an overpopulated jail, one prisoner is executed. And where were most of the overpopulated prisoners in the province? That's why there were the most executions happening. 
Um, partly because of the moratorium on the death penalty, the average time spent by Pakistani prisoners on death row is 13.5 years. The people were essentially serving out a life sentence before they were being executed. A life sentence in Pakistan is 14 years, and people were already serving that and then getting executed. So essentially, they were serving two forms of punishment. So based on the people that we were representing, we soon discovered that a significant majority of all those people who were um, sentenced to that, a lot of them were indigenous, they were poor people who could not afford quality legal representation, and as a result, they were being sentenced to that. Um, a lot of them, over hundreds, were juvenile offender, which, offenders, which meant that they had been sentenced to that for crime that they committed um, while they were below the age of 18. A lot of them were victims of police torture. Now, Pakistan currently does not have a law criminalizing torture, which means that there is a lot of impunity for police officials who practice torture as the primary mode of investigation. And as, and as a lawyer in Pakistan, you know that a lot of the case is built on oral testimony given by witnesses and by confessions drawn from the two parties, which tends to be the primary form of evidence in a lot. So for a lot of our clients, a lot of them did allege that they had in fact been tortured by the police to be the law. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the people were wrongfully convicted. And a civil society estimated that over 60% of all death row prisoners in Pakistan were in practice. Um, a lot of our clients turned out to be mentally ill and physically disabled. So they and these included people who were mentally ill at the time of committing the offense and people who had become mentally ill as a result of the unhygienic and terrible conditions of death row and after having served an average of 13.1 years of death. And interestingly, what was happening was that the president of Pakistan came out and said, I will not be granting mercy or clemency to anybody on Pakistan's death row, just to show that they were being very hard on terrorists, which as we can see, most of the people were, are not actually terrorists. So from uh, December till now, 513 mercy petitions have been rejected, and these include the worst of the worst of our which, we will show you, which I'll show you just now. And not a single mercy petition has been accepted. And because the composition of Pakistan's death row population is uh, composed of the most vulnerable and the most politically powerless, what happens is that the government itself has no idea how many prisoners are Pakistan's death row. It also has failed to keep a track of people's appeals and has failed to keep a track of who currently has not exhausted all of their remedies. As a result, we have seen cases where the Supreme Court has actually acquitted somebody only to find out that they've been executed two years. And this was actually a very famous case of the Bahá'u'lláh brothers, where there were two brothers who were uh, acquitted by the Supreme Court in October 26. And when the decision went back to their families, the families told the press that actually they were even though they had some accusations. This really gives you like an idea of the chaos and um, confusion surrounding the death row population in Pakistan. And this is the context that we're working in. Okay. So one of the questions that we use in a public advocacy when we're trying to communicate the unjust nature of the death penalty to the public is that we say, who are we executing? So one of the people that JPP is currently representing is a man in Abdul Basit entered, was convicted and sentenced to death at the age of 30. The age of 30s. 30s. 30. Okay, 30. So he wasn't a juvenile man. So he entered prison as a healthy man. And <coughs> what happened was that in 2010, at the prison that Abdul Basit was kept in, there were riots that broke out from the prisoners, alleging that the superintendent of the jail was using torture and abuse against the prisoners. So as a result of those riots that broke out, the prison authorities cracked down on the riots, and Abdul Basit and several other prisoners were rounded up and detained in something called the punishment wing of the jail, which essentially there are five, six blocks where you're kept in solitary confinement and you're confined in fetters, and just the worst and uh, worst of unhygienic conditions where people contract all kinds of diseases, such as tuberculosis, meningitis, which is what Abdul Basit referred to. But because he was in the punishment board, Nobody took his complaint seriously. He kept saying, I have a headache, I'm in a lot of pain, I have fever. They ignored that. And it was only when Abdul Basit fainted and went into a coma for three weeks was he provided with any kind of medical help or assistance. When he was transferred to the hospital, 
and he was in a coma for three weeks, the hospital staff told him that he is now paralyzed and he will remain paralyzed for the rest of his life. So, however, despite that, Abdul Basit's first execution warrant was released in June 2015. So, in order to get a stay on that execution, we filed a written petition before the Lahore High Court alleging that a, um, the Pakistan prison rules, which date back to 1894, list out specific procedures on which you can hang somebody. So hanging is the primary method of execution in Pakistan. Now the Pakistan prison rules list out in detail the detailed uh, procedures that you have to follow in order to go through this execution. And if you don't follow the um, procedure, it means that the execution will be botched and will, as a result, be very painful, which ironically, the Pakistan prison rules do not allow. So that was one of the arguments that we used in our repetition that there is no way that you can comply with those procedures stated because the procedure said that you had to measure the length from the chin to the head of the rope. And only then can you, if only if it meets meet like a particular length, can you ensure that the drop doesn't leave somebody decapitated, which has happened quite frequently. That was one of the arguments that we used that since Abdul Basit couldn't even stand, you can't make those measures as well. The second argument that we obviously use and which we were hoping the court would be more agreeable to us that this is cruel in human and treatment. Abdul Basit has already suffered enough, and this would be a form of double jeopardy. You're punishing him twice for that. So, um, unfortunately for us, this the Hor High Court refused to accept our petition and it was rejected. So, we filed the appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, when we went to the Supreme Court, what happened was really shocking with judges making comments such as, well, I mean, who knows how many executions follow the correct procedure? It's not our job to make sure that they follow the procedure down to the team. <laughs> and then the judge came up with this story. <laughs> and the judge came up with this story where he said, you know, this one time in this jail where I was asked to um, witness an execution, there was a man and he was very fat. And when they executed him, the rope broke. And then he fell, but it was okay. They massaged him and then they put him back on the rope again and they executed him again. So he said that it's okay. They don't follow the procedure in all institutions, so it's fine. And then they said that, well, you know, he's already half dead, so the top part of the body will be broken. I mean, I'm not telling you this, uh, I'm only telling you this just to highlight the fact that since the death row population is made of the most vulnerable and politically worthless of our society, and this is how the core system is looking at humanitarian concerns, which would be more valid in other context. So that happened, and the court rejected the appeal as well. But when they rejected the appeal, they put in one line, and they said that we would not be cherry to say that the Pakistan prison authority should follow, follow the Pakistan prison. So we had that one line, and we sat down, and the execution was at 4 a.m., and we got the decision at 8 p.m. So we sat down and we said, okay, what can we do? The Supreme Court has rejected it, there's nothing left. So the first thing we did was we Googled what cherry meant. So, and then when we said, when we figured out what that meant was, we took that order and we drove to Kesabal, and we went to the uh, superintendent of the jail, and we said, oh, have you read this order? He said, of course I've read it. They've rejected the appeal, so we have to go ahead with the execution. But he said, no, you haven't read it. Have you read this one line? <coughs> and he said, no. And then he read it. He's like, what do you mean, Jerry? And I said, it's basically saying that you have to follow Pakistan prison rules. So he said, but we will. And then we made him think about, but well, you can't really, you can't measure him because he can't stand. And then we put this man in this dilemma where he couldn't figure out what to do. <laughs> the we're sitting in his office and he goes out, he's discussing it with somebody, he's like, what do we do? What do we do? The Supreme Court has said we have to follow the Pakistan prison rules. How do we follow them? And then this man became so confused that he stayed the execution. <laughs> and then we bought Abdul Basit a bit more time. But unfortunately, after the execution was stayed, there was yet another terrorist attack. In Punjab. So then the government of Punjab obviously scheduled another day. Now this is where our international involvement came. Because now we knew that there was no way we could win either at the executive level or with the courts because we tried everything. So then we went to the EU. 
Now, what had happened was that at the time, Pakistan and the European Union entered into a trade agreement called the Generalized Scheme of Preference. It's called the GSC Plus Agreement. So the GSC Plus Agreement is actually between the EU and some states, which is Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and where they give you a preferential trade treatment, where they waive some of the tariffs in response to your compliance with 27 international human rights conventions, which included the United Nations International Human Rights Treaty, such as ICPPR, Convention Against Torture. And we found out that actually Pakistan had ratified all of these conventions only to become a party to this GSC plus scheme. And why this GSC plus scheme was so important to the Pakistan Muslim League to remove government is because they are essentially traders in and Pakistan had already benefited over 400 billion euros in trade benefits from this scheme. So this was very important. So now what we found out is that the Attorney General of Pakistan at the time was on this tour of Europe and he was going around meeting members of the European Parliament telling them, oh, Pakistan has done so much and the GSC plus is so important to us and we thought about all of these great like human rights steps. What we did, we thought we have nothing to lose. So we started writing letters to members of the European Parliament, just writing them emails. They were saying, this is Abdul Basit, you will be executed tomorrow. Is there anything you can do? One of them wrote back. One of the members of the European Parliament in Spain wrote back to us and said, I'm very disappointed to hear this. And this is the letter that I sent the Attorney General. He showed us the letter, and the letter said, This is the case of Abdul Basit. If this execution is not stayed, there is no reason for us to. And then we said, Okay, maybe this will work. The next day, we found out that the execution of the boss had been stayed, and the prime minister has, had issued a stay for three months from the boss. And then the prime minister gave like a reassurance to the member of the European Parliament that his execution was not So, even though um, I agree with all the points of international advocacy and the controversial nature of international advocacy, but in this case, we were able to get some of their pressure to work for this one man. Who essentially had no voice within <clears throat> So Abdul Basit is currently, his execution has been indefinitely stayed. What we're trying as an advocacy point is to get his sentence commuted, which is not happening because the government of Pakistan has implemented a policy where they're saying we'll not give mercy to anybody. So right now his situation is that he could be executed any day still because he's on an indefinite state. So that's one of the advocacy points that we are working on now that we <coughs> Another one, as I discussed, that a lot of Pakistan's death row population is made of, of juvenile offenders. And at least six of all those people who were executed um, at, since December 2014 were, in fact, juvenile offenders because they had cre credible evidence to support the fact that they were juvenile offenders. Um, like I said, over hundreds of those on death row sentence, were sentenced to crime as children. Our own figure is 10%, which comes up to 800, but obviously it's not a figure that we throw around with people who don't want to do that. We don't want to make things that we can prove like 100%. Now, why that's happening? Under Pakistan's criminal justice system, there is something called the juvenile justice system. Now, the juvenile justice system ordinance is specifically prohibited the death penalty for juvenile offenders. And that's something that was really confusing for us when we were representing these people. Because why is it that there's an prohibition on the death penalty for juvenile offenders, and still there's people coming out and saying that we were juvenile offenders, and we've been sent to death and we bring it. So what we found out was because there are less than 34% of Pakistan's uh, population is registered at And there are over 46% households that have no form of registration to prove their age or any other kind of situation. So what was happening was that when people were arrested, juvenile offenders, the police would look at them and say, well, I think you look 16, you look 15, and you look 19. And that essentially determined your age throughout the course of the year. And what we did was that we looked at all of the cases in which a person's juvenility came up as a thing. And what we found out that the government was actually rejecting government issued documentations of age in favor of police reform. So, for example, if there is a Nadra, Nadra is our uh, national database where a lot of money has gone into to make computerized work such as that I did so even if there was a Nadra issued birth certificate, the court would say, well, we all know how easy it is to forge documents. So we're just going to rely on the age that the police do. 
So as part of our public advocacy to raise awareness for this issue, we actually made a video that I also mentioned. Yeah. 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 So the picture is, so what we did in this video was that we showed pictures of celebrities and politicians to people on the street, just to show them that you can't really determine somebody's age just by looking at them. And when we went to the people, they seemed really confident that they could. They said, oh yeah, we can do that. But then we showed them and they all ended up giving us really wrong answers. So that's, and unfortunately, I don't think this audience will be able to recognize some of the celebrities and the politicians that we showed the people. We might, we might surprise you. <laughs> So the video actually contained a spoiler as well. What I was getting to is, because we discovered this very specific intervention that we could make that could um, cause a huge improvement in Pakistan's criminal justice system as it applied to juvenile better, which was actually to come up with protocols for determination of age. And that's something, using that as a specific advocacy strategy that we used to communicate directly with parliamentarians and talk about that. We convinced them that <coughs> the introduction of these age determination <coughs> would make Pakistan um, meet its commitments firstly under the JC law and under the international human rights obligations as well. And as a result of consistent advocacy, um, we managed to get these protocols uh, put into a pending law called the Juvenile Justice Systems Bill, which will override the current law. And our currently our public advocacy is working on spread getting the word out there and in order to get people to pressurize their parliamentarians and their constituencies to talk. <coughs> so this is just one of the ways that we're trying to 
tackle the death penalty piece by piece. Because, I mean, what we learned very early on in our advocacy was that if you go out in the public and you say, let's abolish the death penalty, that's not going to get you anywhere. So, <coughs> dividing, them, the, dividing it up thematically and taking it apart piece by piece has been more effective for us rather than going behind. So policing is torture. As I mentioned, that a lot of the people who were facing death penalty in Pakistan were victims of police torture. And in Pakistan, because there is currently no legislation criminalizing torture, what ends up happening is that torture is used with impunity by police officers to extract confessions from them. And this is something that's ex accepted by our social fabric, where people say, of course, people are torture. That goes against, I mean, that's not even a demand. With the fact that whenever we've tried to file um, a post-conviction review, the judges have said, well, this is really a right to come up with more evidence to show why this conviction should be overturned. Um, Pakistan, faced, uh, Pakistan faced its first review by the United Nations Convention Against Torture. And when the Pakistani government was asked to produce evidence of cases <laughs> in which it had taken action, in which torture was alleged and for complaints that it had received, the government passed into only come up with 14 cases since 1945, which is when the country got evident uh, independence from the British. And even in those cases, the penalties were administrative, and they, such as demotion, docking of pay, and not really criminal penalties. Uh, a study by JPP uh, found uh, a total of 1,424 confirmed cases of abuse. From a sample of 1,868 medical legal certificates that had been compiled by the government. So it's not our data. This is these are cases that the government itself has, have, had compiled. Because these people went through a district starting medical board, which is the district starting medical board in each and every each and every district, where you can go and lodge a complaint of torture. So there were 1,424 that had been performed by that government board. However, what we found out that in none of these cases were the complaints pursued and no remedy had been brought out. So, I mean, this is an issue. So, this is an issue that we work on quite extensively where we're trying to get the government to push uh, torture law. But obviously, we have not been very successful. So, another, the, the last theme that I want to discuss with regards to the death penalty is called terror on death row. So, Pakistan has an anti terrorism act which it enacted in 1997. And one of the problems with the anti terrorism act is that it gives a very broad definition to terrorism which it defines terrorism as an act that creates a sense of fear and security in society, which is essentially the definition of terrorism. So in a study that we conducted in December 2014, what we discovered was 86% of all the death sentences that had been given under the Pakistan Anti Terrorism Act were for crimes that bore no nexus to terrorism as it is traditionally. What we found out is that since the Anti Terrorism Act uh, set up this whole parallel system of justice with anti-terrorism courts and expedited trials and expedited investigation. It made the police's job much easier to book people up for terrorism offenses rather than take them through the ordinary criminal justice system. Why this was additionally problematic was that they were weakened procedural safeguards. And the biggest one more for us was that you essentially confessions given in police custody suddenly became invisible as evidence. Which meant that the police would torture suspects into giving these confessions. And a lot of our clients who had been booked on the Anti Terrorism Act did complain that they were tortured. Another problem was that there were no explicit safeguards for juvenile offenders. So, as we saw for uh, juvenile offenders under the order of justice, there, as, there is at least an explicit prohibition on the death penalty. However, the ATA, the Anti Terrorism Act, said that it overrode all laws. So, essentially, even if you were proved as a juvenile and the court accepted you as a juvenile offender, you were still be sentenced to death under the Antiterrorism Act because the Antiterrorism Act was made precedence over all of them. And in this case, we actually had a case of Muhammad Iqbal, which is still pending, where the court actually conducted a medical test which found him to be a juvenile offender at the time of the medical test, but because he's been tried and convicted under the ATA, and he's still facing the death penalty. Okay, so. One of the cases that I want to talk about before we discuss uh, our international topic, which is one of the most mentioned now, um, is the execution of mentally ill people in Pakistan. So um, last year we had a case for one of our clients who's a paranoid schizophrenic. His name was Imdad. Imdad was sentenced to death um, back in 1999, and it was only until after he'd been sentenced to death and he entered prison was that the prison authorities found out that he's a paranoid. 
Now, as any law, we're going to have to wrap up at about 4, uh, 440. So we need to leave some time. For so long story short, the course convicted in that to death. Now, what happened was that in the appeal that dismissed uh, the writ petition against Imdad, um, uh, of course, asking for a stay of execution, the court actually came out and said, we don't think schizophrenia is a mental illness. So what ended up happening is because this created such a hue and cry in the international diplomatic community is what ended up resulting in the difference in that law. So, so this brings me to our international advocacy strategy. Like I said, the GSC plus mechanism made it possible for us to engage with the United Nations and the European Parliament. So because Pakistan ended up submitting, one thing that we said to the European Parliament was that, please make sure that Pakistan submits its reports under the treaty body rights. So unless and until Pakistan submitted its reports, there could be no reviews by the UN. So what Pakistan did was that they submitted all of their reports in one day. And now that Pakistan has submitted all of its reports in one day, so within the course of six months, Pakistan was lined up for 27 months. So for our international advocacy, we made sure that we were present on every single review that Pakistan underwent. And we provided the committee with details of all the cases that everybody who uh, was facing execution. So the first review made no difference. The second review made no difference. But once we started going to get into review number three, number four, number five, we got the Pakistani government to come back and scale back on a lot of the executions and commit to a lot of the legislative reform that we were pushing. So I think we can go for I think let's just jump right into it. Um, hi, so in terms of thinking about like strategic litigation, I know you've mentioned using Pakistan's domestic criminal law as well as like international advocacy. Is there any effectiveness in thinking about civil suits, like for example, suing an individual police department for like torture or like suing prison officials for like wrongful execution or like is that a non-starter? So I'm interested in uh, knowing how how you were successful in your public advocacy uh, work. Uh, what linkages did you have? Any political, any uh, any other method that you got parliamentarians to listen to you? Very interesting. I have two questions. Um, when you said those with disabilities who are mentally ill or physically disabled, uh, were, were there also cases of people who are mentally disabled? Because there is a difference between people who are mentally ill and mentally disabled. Um, I'm talking about like cognitive mental disability because just like people who are mentally ill, they wouldn't be able to. Now again, I'm coming from an American reference, um, working in legal clinics, um, they're not able to effectively assist in their defense and, and at least give a, a, a a clear perspective of their own of what they endured sometimes or often. The other question I have is, um, you know, we see the blasphemy cases. Are there many under the um, Anti-Terrorism Act? Um, are are you coming across cases where people are making claims of somebody being a terrorist or engaging in suspect or terrorist activity as a means of procuring their their a, a surreptitious means of procuring their their property, things like that? Um, is that uh, kind of a, a premise or an issue that you come up with? Or that you have to deal with? So I'm mean, coming to you. Are there any questions? Why don't you start now? So coming to your question about the civil suits. So we have something in Pakistan and in India in the Bangladesh called the Treaty. What we do is essentially we have an article called Article 199 of the British Constitution which allows us to file civil essentially what will be a civil action suit against a public official for detention. I mean that option is there, of course, in the law. And but unfortunately we haven't had much success with it in terms of reduced torture cases. The best that you can do in a written petition, and that's the success that we've had, is that we've asked the judges just produced the police officer in court and given him an domination and asked him not to do it again and some kind of um, damages were given to the, the victims of torture. 
But unfortunately, what happens is that because the victims of torture are so scared of the police that they will not come and file a repression. And this exists because there is no law against torture, so there is no independent investigation mechanism for the police. So in a lot of these writ petitions, what the judge ends up doing is that they order the police to start an investigation against the police. Because there is no alternative body that can undertake that investigation. So, I mean, you can only guess what happens through that investigation. A lot of our cases, especially the ones in Pesabad, what ended up happening was that the police ended up harassing the family of the victims to withdraw their complaint. So a lot of the victims had to move away from their cities and hide from the police. So unless and until we keep, until we set up like an institutional paper for torture, I don't see that any success that. Um, yeah. Sorry, the question about public advocacy. Right? So I mean, in, starting from our advocacy with parliamentary, so now we had to be very strategic about this. So like I said, initially when we started advocacy strategy was to tell the parliament <coughs> to bring back the more team of that. But given the political climate, which was terrorism, hang and all, this was not good. And we didn't have much success. So what we started doing was we started telling the parliamentarians very limited and very specific things that they could do in legislation, legislation, which seemed really harmless on the face. So if I, unless and until I say death penalty, that's okay. So if I don't say death penalty, that's okay. For example, with the juvenile justice system bill, the bill essentially doesn't apply only to the death penalty. It's for the identification of juveniles so that they can be tried under a special scheme of protection and therefore it also includes things like rehabilitation and parole officer. So to put, put age determination protocols within that bill was not something that was perceived as harmful to the So that's the success. However, even within the death penalty, like I said, there's two primary political parties in Pakistan's party. You have the PMLN and then you have the now, the PMLN is very anti the death penalty and it was a non started to go going to that process. But with the PPP, because they had a moral opposition to death penalty, it was useful for us to approach people within the PPP who were on these key committees in the parliament. For example, the Standing Committee on Human Rights, I got to sign up. In Pakistan, there's a rule that once the bill gets passed through the respective committees, passed, I mean, nobody in the parliament is talking about it. It was really our task to identify people from the PPP within this. Key committees and get them to sign up on the bill and get support. The third question. Okay, so firstly, mental mental illness and cognitive problems. I mean, what I couldn't get to because of the lack of time was that in Pakistan there is essentially no condition on the execution of mental illness. The criminal justice system says that you cannot try people who are mentally ill, and the term it uses is unsound mind, which is an archaic term that it's taken from the 1800s back when the British were calling. So the term unfound mind is the most extreme of the which essentially means that you, you were not able to understand the effects that you create. However, if your mental illness is not detected throughout the course of your time, or the judge doesn't accept it, and you're already convicted and sentenced to death, then there's nothing that can detect. So what we're trying to do with the Dadavi case is we're trying to introduce a prohibition on the execution of mental illness, which means that even if you contract a mental illness subsequent to your sentence, there is a protection for you that you will not face. But cognitive disabilities, um, so we're working very closely with psychiatrists. So there is a mental health ordinance in Pakistan. So what we're working on them is that they, when the case gets decided, they will give the definition of what it means to be mentally ill. And their definition, which is under the Pakistani Mental Health Ordinance, is quite expansive and it includes and it includes cognitive disability that was not But to date, I am not aware of any case where they could they sought protection based on the On last week, um, if I understand your question correctly, have people been um, Convicted under the Anti Terrorism Act for false death No, no, I was asking if they were, if people were linked to false charges, you know, in a skeptical <coughs> attempt to procure their land. I mean, oh, absolutely. Cases, I saw cases like that in India, that's why. Absolutely. So, for the Anti Terrorism Act, because the police has so much power to book somebody as a terrorist, and essentially it's the police that, uh, the police that gets to decide who gets booked in the Anti Terrorism Act. And who doesn't? So what ends up happening is that people give a lot of bribes to the police, 
And a lot of the time, it's a property dispute where the person gets accused of murder, kidnapping, rape, etc., etc., and gets booked as a terrorist. And once you're booked and you're under the anti-terrorism regime, I mean, it's there's a sure shot that you will not be tied to the trial. And at the end of the day, you'll be tortured in session and so on. That process is carried forward. Actually, in one of our cases, um, Aftab Bahadur, there was a person who said that he had been booked because there was a copy of his group with Dina. He met him. And the computer was in the kidnap just so he could get him out of the chair. So that does happen. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a um, question about, actually, just informational question. Um, the Pakistan prison rules that come from the 1890s, of course, the Indian Penal Code from which it's derived had anti torture legislation. So, when does the Pakistan IPC Pakistan, kind of decide not to, to remove the torture? Like, when does that happen? Do you know? And the second qu question is, um, is the Justice Project ideologically opposed to death penalty, or are, is the project aimed at sort of addressing these you know, questions of miscarriage of justice you know, or a more humane treatment of prisoners? Do you see that as a, just a strategic thing, or is the project itself philosophically divided on the question of death penalty? Um, so you mentioned uh, the disparities between the amount of people on death row in the different provinces with Punjab having the most. And I was wondering if that's because of the way that the power is distributed between the provinces or if it has more to do with which province is affected by terrorism more. So I mean, in response to your question, we're absolutely ideological. That is why we started the Justice Project and we wanted to work on this. But well, strategically speaking, um, the lives of our clients come first. And if we pursue the line of defense saying that this person shouldn't get the death penalty because we are opposed to death penalty, death penalty is morally wrong, that would not get us anywhere in Pakistan, of course, or in the world. So strategically, everything that we do, uh, targeting the various human rights violations that exist in the death penalty, is a strategic move on our part make sure that we can get that remedy for our clients. And even in terms of our work with the parliamentarians, we're trying to create a system where we can decrease the number of executions over time. So if the juveniles can get these safeguards, that automatically means that we will also not be executed. If we can get a prohibition on the executions of mentally ill people, that automatically means that they're not ill people will not be executed. If we can get a torture law in place, that means that we cannot torture people to take So that's really what we're looking for. But one of the advocacy us that we asked with the United Nations and the EU because we can do that in those forms is to bring back the moratorium of the death penalty. And then we say conduct an investigation into all of the cases that are on currently on Pakistan of death row. And for cases where there are human rights violations, you should commute all of those sentences. <coughs> and one of our key advocacy asks that we're actually having a lot of success with is to reduce the scope of Pakistan's death penalty. Right now it's 27 crimes and to reduce it to a bare minimum make it uh, more and more difficult for courts to give out the death penalty as is the CS. Question on Punjab specificity. Um, like I said, um, Punjab, the government in Punjab is the Kima, which is <coughs> a big supporter of the death penalty. The government in Sindh is the PPP, which is not a supporter. Uh, for the rest of the provinces, the governments are not that passionate about the death. So essentially, why Punjab is the highest number of death sentences is because there is a political will to push the death penalty. And essentially, like there is an institutional culture where judges in Punjab give out the death penalty rights. Also, um, the Punjab police tends to book people for cases that carry the death penalty. So, and generally, um, this is just my observation of the social scenario in Punjab. It's generally a very litigious province where people tend to get <laughs> revenge on other people by booking them. <laughs> I mean, there is no one explanation as to, as to why that's happening, but that's just what I think based on my own experience. Uh -huh. Yes, Sarah. Yes. Um, 
it was a brilliant presentation. Um, I want to ask how your work was received by other organizations, lawyers' organizations, particularly women's groups, and you get um, you get a lot of hostility. Let's take one more right behind you. Maybe two more. Thank you, Zainab. Um, I'm a strong believer in and supporter of uh, the impact of international human rights system, and I think you presented a very powerful case of how the international community the human rights system impacted this particular practice. But if, I, if we could put this case under social scientific kind of scrutiny, um, there, there are several other alternative explanations for the outcome. So you clearly demonstrated that the number of executions declined from 32 to 88 to 56. Now, one could um, make an argument that uh, there was a moratorium prior to the, right, uh, 2015, uh, when the execution started in 2015. So uh, there could be an argument that there were a lot of cases that were kind of easy to proceed on. Uh, and then the number declined. Um, also, the number declined in 2016, and then the first uh, uh, examination of the Pakistan in, in the UN system is in March 2016. I wonder, is it really after March 2016 that the uh, number of executions started declining? Or, um, and if you have if you had this number, monthly number of executions uh, in your presentation, if you kind of correlate that with these events that um, where the Pakistani government felt international pressure, then you might have more of a smoking gun. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have further evidence to demonstrate the impact of the system. Just, uh, Second question quickly. This is a um, about human rights violation by the government, and believe it or not, it's a relatively easier case to deal with. Uh, if you if if the situation involves changing the public's mind if it's social discrimination, for instance, in the Pakistani case, if you try to stop honor killing, for instance, or raising uh, uh, for women's rights, those cases would be a little more challenging. And I wonder if you think this approach could also work in addressing uh, those kinds of issues. I think maybe we have to leave the last yeah, last one. Go ahead, Zaya. So, um, ask question. Um, so when the moratorium was brought back and they started executing people, we received a very negative reaction. Everything that we said in defense of our clients was ripped to shred. And that was, in a way, it was almost like we were being fired. And actually, one of the cases that we worked on is Dina And this case was just, uh, it was just a very difficult thing for us to do because it was a juvenile offender. We produced a school living service to prove his age and like to focus on the population. He had no other end. So, in the pushback to that, uh, the media came out and said that he is a child molester. He raped a girl. None of this is true. He's not a juvenile and he's alleging to be a juvenile. And what the media did was they actually came up with this television program series where they reenacted this, these events surrounding the crime the shock was committed and they came up with this play just to show how horrific everything was. And that was something that was very difficult for us to do to an extent that we had to go underground and not talk about a lot of our cases as well. But however, we had uh, a lot of success because then we started doing our public advocacy, and the one thing that we were doing before was to reaching out to the general public with our advocacy. Because there is no way that you can get the post to the community unless and until you get the public to be on their side as well. What we started doing was for cases, we started bringing the families and of the people who have been sentenced to death public and kind of telling their story to the family and to create that empathy for people. Or for people who are in class and death row and what suffering that they've gone through. And slowly and steadily, the, because I mean, it's no secret in Pakistan that the criminal justice system is unfair. And if you ask any person on the street, they'll say, of, say, of course, only the rich get justice and the poor don't. So this is not something that we have to prove to them. So in bringing these stories forward, we started getting the people more and more on the side. And actually, the figures that I showed you when we did the statistical analysis and we interviewed we did the report earlier this year. The report was actually carried in all leading newspapers in Pakistan, which is the first time that you got the press to come out and speak out against the government's policy. 
So, I mean, slowly and steadily, we were able to make that impact. And I can't really speak on behalf of our communications team because they do an excellent job. So, what they do is that they do street performances and they do plays and they try to bring the stories for the prisoners uh, to the general public for alternative means such as TV shows, they do a radio series. And slowly and steadily, they're kind of creating that space for people to talk about who exactly is on it. And that's actually created a huge impact over the course of four years. So it takes like everything. And now more and more, every time the government comes out and says we're executing person X, Y, Z, people are more skeptical and saying, well, actually, did the person actually commit this crime or are you just making it up? So I mean, with regards to women's groups, um, specifically our advocacy on the Anti-Terrorism Act has been the most controversial. Because actually, it was the women's group that got gang rape and rape inserted as a terrorist crime within the Anti-Terrorism Act. But why that happened was because under the ordinary criminal justice system, these cases were taking years and years to resolve. So a normal rape case would take over the course of 20, 25 years. But because the Anti-Terrorism Act had set up this deadline that you have 30 days to complete investigation and seven days to complete the trial. So women's rights group actually wanted rape to go through that particular act. Now that ends up defeating our purpose because the Anti-Terrorism Act prescribed the death penalty for a whole day. So it does make things for people. For your question about the decline in the execution figures and the correlation between the international review, I mean, the thing is that so before every review, Pakistan had to go through a review. So what happens is that the submissions that you start making for, which is quite uh, difficult for not NGOs because it's very hard to keep a track of all the deadlines and start preparing like a unit. So for every review, six months before every review, there would be submissions from NGOs. And then the committees will give like these list of issues that the government has responded. So because of all the NGO reports focusing a lot on the death penalty and all of these cases, the government kept getting asked for a specific number. And like I said, the reviews weren't taking place in a vacuum. What was happening is was the EU, because of the GSC plus mechanism, those reviews were going uh, play side by side. So every time the GSC plus committee would conduct a review, the government would get asked about the including observation and the list of issues that had come out from the UN reviews as well. So because they had so many, and I couldn't list all of them because not all of them are relevant to one. So there was the EFR, the Disabilities Convention, there were a bunch of other reviews that happened. So because the government, and what happened, and it's, it was a great experience, so when we first went to the CRC review, the government came, was really hostile towards us and said that we will commit to the death penalty, we will keep excluding people, these people are liars. The death penalty was possible. The second review, they said the same. The third review, they said, okay, <coughs> we gave this person a stay, we're bringing this amendment for the death penalty, we're trying to look into reducing the scope and all of that. But then what we found out that our views were getting rejected so much as well. And there were directions from the Ministry of Interior to slow, to slow down the rate of execution before every time before the GSC plus committee came into this Pakistan or before it was. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to say that the reviews are solely responsible for bringing down the rate of executions because, as you said, there was a moratorium in place. And what happened, and what the government said before was that because there were so many people, we had to keep executing them, and that's why the rate of executions was much higher. But Amnesty International actually came out with a report last year where they said that even though the executions had gone down in Pakistan, those death sentences actually <coughs> down. So the courts are still executing, more, are still sentencing more and more people. So, Pakistan death was still, even though they can be Thank you very much indeed, and please join me in.